Good evening, everyone. My name is Sue Ann Hong, and I'm the president and CEO for the Center for Asian Pacific American Women. Welcome to day three of the Multicultural Women's Conference. It's been an incredible week so far, including the very interactive mentoring session last night hosted by APIA scholars in Wells Fargo. I hope you'll engage the second session tomorrow night as we have incredible mentors. I wanna thank the steering committee who put this incredible conference together, OCA advocate, as well as the greater DC chapter, Boys and Girls Club of America Native Services, Alvanza, VMT Consulting, and Women's Entrepreneurial Opportunity Project. I also wanna thank our community partners, APIA Scholars and National ACE, and our corporate sponsors, AARP, ADP, Walmart, and UPS. Since Monday, we've had much conversation around the impact of COVID-19, especially to women and women of color and our vulnerable population. Tonight, our theme is our inner strengths, respond, rebuild, and recover. Our first session is titled, What Matters to Us? A Lens on Overall Health and Wellness, Fighting COVID-19. As a part of this discussion, I want to call out the role of the caregiver, whose labor has been often unrecognized, is now coming to, into clearer focus. Hundreds of thousands of women have left the labor force due to caregiving responsibilities. The issue has grown so large and disruptive to the economy that the national discourse on the value of care work has started to shift. Now, there's, we're to moderate the session is Joanne Tabalea Murphy, National Director of Public Affairs and Corporate Affairs at Walmart. Thanks, Sue Ann. I'm looking forward to having this very important and timely conversation this evening. We started this week talking about the impact of COVID-19 to our underserved communities and more specifically women of color. Let me share with you a New York Times article titled, Working Women of Color Were Making Progress, Then the Coronavirus Hit. Part of this article I'll read to you here real quick. For years, the story of working women in the United States has been one of slow but steady progress. Against this backdrop, the latest monthly employment figures from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics delivered an acute shock. A net total of 144,000 jobs were lost in December. The clear effect of the continuing economic downturn, but while male employment increased slightly, 156,000 women lost their jobs, mainly in pandemic hit sectors such as hospitality and education. And since the employment of white women actually increased on net, these losses fell on women of color. That's big stuff right there. Today, our panel experts will discuss what is the current state of the process of vaccination, especially the vulnerable population, such as our seniors. What is the misinformation about COVID and what needs to be done about it? How will we move forward as it relates to vaccine implementation and what can we do individually and collectively to help ourselves and others? So you may be wondering why the COVID vaccine subject is so important to my company, Walmart. We are not just part, we're not just your community, we're, we're part of it. And this is also about health equity, right? Walking the talk, Walmart's commitment of $100 million over five years to racial equity and addressing systemic racism. Yep, all of that. Now, don't forget, if you have any questions, please make sure you put them in the chat box as we'll be checking them, checking the chat box frequently. Let me take a moment and introduce you to our panelists. Our first panelist is Rita Chola, Director of Caregiving at AARP Public Policy Institute. Our next panelist is Karen Kwok, Family Nurse Practitioner at, in hospitals and community clinics. Our next guest is Dr. Chini Paluru, Senior Director of Clinical Transformation, Innovation and Operations at Walmart. 
And we have a, our guest, Ian Simon, who is a science policy analyst at IDA Science and Technology Policy Institute. Welcome to all of you. And if you could, in the order that I introduced you in, please introduce, take a minute and introduce yourself. Hello, and thank you, uh, Sue Ann, and to all of the organizers of this wonderful event. My name is Rita Shula, and I am the Director of Caregiving with the AARP Public Policy Institute. My focus is on supporting family caregivers across the country as they seek to find ways to provide care for those, um, for their loved ones and others whom they uh, care for. I look forward to this discussion. Thank you. Rick Karen? Thank you to the organizers here for having this timely discussion. And I'm so honored to be on this distinguished panel providing different perspectives of what um, caregiving and the COVID experience has been, particularly from my nursing perspective as a family nurse practitioner in the community. I have seen um, firsthand what are important issues for my community members and I'm happy to elevate that voice. So thank you very much. Thanks, Karen. Dr. Chinney. Hi, everyone. Thank you, uh, Sue Ann and Joanne, as well as the rest of the organization for having us and, and my fellow panelists for, for um, serving here. Uh, I, I serve to lead clinical operations for Walmart Health and um, you know have worked intimately within the organization to help uh, the organization bring testing as well as vaccines to many communities that don't have otherwise have access to healthcare and, and access to vaccines. So very proud of that. And as a family medicine physician, a mom and a wife uh, and, and someone who has um, had to balance a lot of issues, I, I think that, um, you know, it's not lost on me that women of color are are deeply impacted by what's happening in, in this pandemic. So thank you. Thanks, Jenny. And Ian. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. It's, a, it's a, an honor to be part of this panel uh, with these uh, amazing women. And uh, thank you for uh, inviting uh, a man to join the party. I do appreciate that. Uh, so I uh, work in an organization, a uh, nonprofit organization, uh, named the Science and Technology Policy Institute. We uh, support uh, the federal government with um, independent uh, science policy analysis. Uh, my area of expertise is uh, in infectious disease preparedness um, uh, and policies at the national level. Uh, I'm a virologist by training and received my PhD in vaccine development. Uh, so uh, this has been a particularly um, uh, relevant time for the work that I do. Uh, and I'm also a, a, a locally elected official uh, in, uh, here in Washington, DC, an advisory neighborhood commissioner where um, we serve as a, the link and the representative for our neighbors to the district government. And that's also been a, a particularly um, uh, valuable um, role in this time in this fight. Um, against uh, fight against COVID. Thanks, Ian. Now, let me share with you um, where we are as of yesterday with the impact of COVID-19. Um, John Hopkins University of Medicine COVID stats that were released as of March 2nd show that there were, the U.S. confirmed cases are at 28,704,758 and U.S. deaths are at 515 million sorry, 515,985. So my question to the panelists is, what is your role in the fight against the prevention and the spread of COVID-19? And we'll start with Rita, please. Thank you. So my role really is uh, working um, in partnership across the country with my colleagues at ARP. At ARP, we are dedicated and, and committed to ensuring 
that uh, those 50 plus receive the vaccines and receive access um, to the vaccines. My role is really more around family caregiving. We know that COVID-19 has disproportionately affected so many communities of color. And within those communities of color, often are caregivers who are invisible. Uh, they are the ones behind the scenes caring for the mothers, the grandmothers, the spouses, whomever it may be. And now increasingly due to COVID-19 are caring for children at home um, and trying to work as well. And so it really is, um, it has been, I should say, an honor to help support those family caregivers um, through this and help work with healthcare professionals in particular to better support their needs as well. Wow, powerful work. Chinny, how about you? So, um, you know, I, I'm honored to be a part of an organization that uh, when COVID-19 hit, we found ourselves being essential workers in many communities, making sure there was, you know, groceries that were stocked and and people had access to um, products and, and and things that were needed for their lives. So, part of my role was helping to um, helping to ready the organization and help our associates not only stay safe but make sure that our stores and environments were safe for our customers and consumers. And then it pivoted to, um, you know, helping bring to life our testing centers, because if you can't test and you didn't know um, who had COVID, it was, you, you couldn't do what was necessary to prevent it or stop it. And so, you know, we're, we brought to life over 600 testing centers through public and private partnerships. And so, um, you know, really impactful. And most recently helping, you know, the, the teams and teams of people that are helping to get vaccine and shots into arms as fast as we can throughout the country, um, particularly in areas that are healthcare deserts. Wow, thank you. And Ian, you said in your introductions, you said a little bit about what you do, but uh, tell us a little more. Sure. Um, so uh, with the, the work that I'm doing at the Science Technology Policy Institute, um, you know, one of the, the, the roles that, that we serve is to um, be uh, support for crises like this when the federal government um, is, is trying to get a handle on uh, an emerging outbreak. So the last February and March, uh, we, were, uh, we formed uh, rapid response teams to really help with uh, providing clear and accurate information uh, as uh, combined with um, the data combined with uh, policy implications and options uh, to decision makers. And then uh, in my role, uh, sort of uh, extracurricular role as a neighborhood commissioner, um, it's, it's almost the, uh, the opposite end. It's the last mile type of things. And it's trying to serve my community, which um, I live in a very diverse community in terms of uh, uh, demographics, race demographics, uh, gender demographics, uh, um, undocumented workers, uh, Latinx, and making sure that at all parts of the neighborhood are, are able to access um, uh, vaccines. Uh, first, it was, it was testing uh, early on in the pandemic and, and then vaccines. And so a lot of the work is, is really the block by block work, how you get um, neighborhoods and uh, um, and really apartment buildings, uh, the same equitable access to um, medical treatments and vaccines. Great, and how about you, Karen? So as a nurse practitioner, I'm boots on the ground and um, I interface with um, the information gathered from policymakers such as um, Ian and then regarding community partners such as um, Dr. Paluru regarding access to tests, access um, now to vaccines and um, in the overall caregiving um, that I appreciate from Rita's perspective, it is um, being able to empower power my patients with 
filtering what is uh, the appropriate education that they need to inform their decisions on avoiding um, the spread of um, COVID. How are they determining for themselves what is appropriate? Um, when's the right time for getting COVID vaccination? Because we've been also involved in the contact tracing of those that are exposed, but then also those who unfortunately have turned out positive. And so that's how we've been involved in prevention and education and empowerment. Thank you. Oh, that, that's real. And we're, we'll get into some of that in, in, a, in a minute here. Um, so let's talk about, you know, how are we doing so far in these efforts? What's going well? Chinny, do you want to do you want to take that? Of what do you think is going well? Sure. Um, you know, I, I I think that the vaccine rollout and the recent efforts in the last few weeks to get as many vaccines to the country as much as possible is, is going um, well and, and, and as much as could be expected at this point in time. And so I think we've done a fantastic job of, of the delivery and, and, and getting the vaccine out in the last few weeks. I also, you know, and then I don't, I'd be remiss to mention that, you know, just developing the vaccine was, was um, an amazing feat for us and being able to develop it in that time. The, the state and federal partnerships and allocations and getting the vaccine to communities that are underserved and communities of color um, is also, I feel, something that we've done a, a good job of, of making sure we prioritize and making sure we prioritize high risk people. That, that's, that, that makes a lot of good sense. And I'm glad to hear that. Um, Ian, um, you know, we talked about, Chuni talked about underserved communities. There's also um, children that we really haven't talked about and thought about. Um, what do you think is going well so far? And um, what does that mean from a children's perspective? Sure, yeah. Um, so, so Cheney is exactly right. The, the science is one of the bright spots in all of this. The science has really um, gone well. Uh, it's, uh, it's amazing that, uh, you know, 11 months uh, into, um, you know, the, the, the really uh, severe effects that we've seen in this country of a pandemic. Within 11 months, we have three uh, completely safe or, or, or you know, uh, uh, for all intents and purposes, completely safe, three highly effective vaccines. Um, that's, that's incredible. I think that's one of these uh, uh, tales that you can tell when everybody marshals their forces uh, behind, um, uh, behind a proven public health interventions, what, what can happen. And so the next step is to extend that to, uh, to all populations so that we can uh, get everyone vaccinated get to herd immunity and start living our lives again like we used to. And so the next step is to uh, make sure that this is safe and effective with children. So uh, to reach herd immunity, we've got to reach a, a level of around 70 to 85% of the population must be vaccinated. That's the latest estimates we've seen. Uh, a quarter of the US population are, are under 18, right? So we've got to make sure that, that, that children are a part of this uh, Part of this solution as well. And so what, uh, what happened first was uh, there were clinical studies done with adults. And uh, what, we're, what we're gonna see are the clinical studies with teenagers and adolescents coming quickly. I think in the, the latest literature I saw said by May, we'll have those studies complete and the data will be, um, will be analyzed. And then by the late summer, early fall, uh, vaccination of teenagers at 12 and up can start. And so once we get, in, uh, once we get into to, to that realm, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a, a game changer in terms of uh, back to school, um, uh, get, making sure that we can uh, get, back to, get back to our lives uh, in terms of taking care of our children. Um, it's, it's gonna be, it's really gonna be great. And then uh, the other studies of six, uh, nine to 12 year olds and six to nine year olds, those will be uh, following on quickly afterwards. Good, good to hear. I'm glad to hear that. Um, Rita, some of the, there are some opportunities for improvement, right? Um, with the vac vaccination process. Um, from your point of view, can you share your insights on that? Oh, you're on mute. 
the words you hate to hear. Um, I think that <laughs> there are a few opportunities um, in this space. I think um, uh, Chinny did talk about uh, how uh, vaccines are being expanded um, into communities of color, but I still think that there is a lot of room for improvement in that space. We're still hearing um, stories. I live in Maryland myself and my county in particular, Prince George's County um, is, is talking um, with the state now about uh, you know the lack of availability of vaccines. So I do think it's still very important that as we look at communities of color, I think a lot of the conversation has been focused on this idea of vaccine hesitancy, but sometimes it really is the community wants the vaccines and they're not available in the community. I think another area uh, for improvement is around messaging. We know that, um, and, uh, and access, how to get through it. At ARP, we hear all the time um, about uh, those older adults, 50 plus, that are really struggling to get appointments, to be able to work through the computer system if they don't have access to a computer, um, being able to get someone on the phone. Um, I've heard stories of people having to drive eight hours or stand in line for several hours. So we have to ensure that as fast as we roll uh, the vaccines out, that the access and information on how to get to those vaccines and ensuring that individuals won't have show up and there is no vaccine um, or uh, they're not able to really even get through the system. So um, really ensuring that that support is there. And then finally, I think around family caregivers, um, it varies from state to state. Uh, whether a family caregiver who may not fit into a particular category that is uh, open um, for vaccines is actually able to get one. Um, I have a, had an instance of a family friend who was really upset because she did not fit into a category, but she was caring for her 98-year-old mom and also caring for a 70-plus uh, partner. Um, and she said, basically, she said, if I go down, then nobody is here to care for them. So I'm desperate for help. So more, again, information um, and access across the board. Really good points. I know that we're working, um, we've been distributing translated material because there's such a need for um, helping those communities that are not served. And, and, and so getting that material is really important on how the how to, right? Um, Karen, what about mental health um, when it comes to opportunities for improvement? Definitely. Thanks for um, the question. I always like to plug in the importance of mental health, given um, how that has been um, further exacerbated by social isolation and um, just the ongoing protracted uh, stress, um, not to mention that um, the technicalities of getting vaccinated and access to those preventative services are really, really stressful. And so um, actually my appointed uh, role as a commissioner through the mayor's office um, on API affairs here in DC, um, there were some highlights that I was really happy about, not just in terms of um, mental health, but ensuring that our seniors had a buddy program um, to sign up for our vaccinations and then um, particularly in wards five seven and eight where the case rate as well as the mortality was highest for COVID that there have been targeted concerted efforts in that area we actually are hoping in May um, in commemoration of mental health month to sponsor an event as well just also in recognition of this one year of COVID so thank you. That's that's really great to hear. Um, you know, Ian kind of uh, touched on misinformation or maybe accurate information. So um, I'm looking for examples of misinformation and hesitancy about, you know, COVID vaccine 19 or COVID 19 and the vaccine and what can we do about it? So Ian, do you want to dive a little deeper in that into that? Sure. Yeah. So there's, uh, you know, there's there's misinformation, but then there's also um, uh, partial information mixed with some real world concerns and fears. And so one of the first steps is to is to really understand that that uh, not everyone has had the same experiences with, you know, 
frankly, our healthcare system uh, over their lifetimes. Uh, not everyone has the same, um, you know, history uh, working uh, with different kinds of authorities or, or government authorities. So understanding that, that there is a there's an actual uh, base to the concern, speaking to that concern and really informing uh, the public why um, despite those concerns, uh, this effort to try and protect um, uh, folks from dying from a, uh, a deadly infectious disease is being done in a way with, uh, with as much uh, consciousness to, to equity and fairness and really life, liberty, and allowing people to live long enough to pursue their own happiness. I think, I think that's the other thing that, that um, uh, really needs to come through along with correcting any misinformation out there. Good, very good, good points. Um, Ginny, from your point of view, uh, what, what, what are you seeing as far as information and hesitancy in, with the vaccine? So, you know, we're, we're still seeing in you know, a vast majority of our areas more demand than supply. However, vaccine hesitancy is a real thing. And, and you know, we shouldn't, I think we, within the Walmart infrastructure, um, made sure that our pharmacists were trained. They were trained on vaccine hesitancy, how to handle it, um, trained on the facts of the three vaccines that have gotten the emergency use authorization and how to address it and also some of the cultural differences that go into vaccine hesitancy and, and making sure that we acknowledge them because we do have to acknowledge you know, the different places that people start out when they are viewing healthcare and, and particularly vaccines. Yeah, that's, that's for certain. Trust is a big factor, right? And Karen, um, what are you seeing? You know, you're kind of boots on the ground, right? <laughs> So with my patients, it is helping guide the process of curating knowledge because it really is coming in every day. There are changes in protocols week by week and just setting up the expectation correctly that, hey, um, staying informed is the top priority and then doing a personal risk assessment with my patients as to, Yes, you recently had COVID. So in your particular scenario, we would consider this time frame in which you would actually consider um, getting the vaccinations because of the benefits still being conferred mm -hmm. um, and with the waning immunity after um, three plus months. And having that knowledge base and that guidance in the process is, is really um, important because um, information is always evolving. Um, and then I'm pointing to the correct um, sources of information that can speak to safety and efficacy, particularly because my patient population is um, African-American. And so there's a lot of historical uh, trauma in the interface with the medical system as um, Ian so well put. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Rita, um, what is AARP doing to support vulnerable populations from a caregiver's perspective? I think uh, two things, uh, multiple things, but two things in particular come to mind. I think the first really is around nursing homes, which is something that we haven't discussed here. Um, from the very onset of COVID, uh, the increased death rate um, in nursing homes uh, has been traumatic to so many across the country. Um, now that there are vaccines, um, one of our big focuses was really ensuring that um, the uh, residents in nursing homes and other facilities had access to those. But even, even with that, ensuring that family caregivers, those that have been apart from their families, you know, it's, it's, it's important and great to be able to do virtual visits, but to be able to hold someone's hand or hug them through this, speaking of isolation, has been so important. Uh, my mom was in a facility and unfortunately we lost her in uh, October and um, it was on her deathbed that I was able to hold her hand. And so I understand the grueling factor that goes with that and that feeling. And so to ensure now that family caregivers are beginning to get access, whether it's one or more um, as vaccines increase across the country, 
is very important. I think the second part is recognizing that nobody, no one organization, no one government agency can do this alone. So creating strategic partnerships, both at a national level and at a local level with trusted partners, uh, individuals in the community um, is crucially important um, throughout all of this, whether it's educating around um, prevention from COVID or even um, really um, encouraging individuals to take vaccines. No one organization can do this alone. We need conversations like this. We need to ensure that, that we are working on the ground and across the country. Well, let me just, just pause for a moment. And from all of us, uh, to you and your family, we let us express our condolences. Um, we're giving you many virtual hugs. So Thank you. just just know that we're here for you. Um, I think we're going to go over to do a Q&A check here. Sue Ann? Yes, uh, this question comes from Mary Tom. And she says, with Dr. Fauci sharing the piecemeal vaccination of children from age 18 and under, Will students, teachers, and school staff be safe as we await the completion of clinical trials? CDC now recognizes that teachers should have priority vaccination, which is great, but could, could the student impact each other if they're not observing social distancing and face facial masking when they return in class learning? Uh, I'll kind of open up that up to whoever wants to take that on. Perhaps um, maybe, maybe I'll start. Um, so yes, so uh, teachers, uh, um, our, our, our states are being encouraged to prioritize uh, vaccination for teachers. I think it's a great, um, great idea. Um, you know what? What the CDC uh, has put out with their uh, their guidelines for return to in person learning is uh, I think what they call is a, is a layered approach. It's a multi-step approach. So it's not just vaccines, it's not just social distancing. It's, it's you know, if, you're, if the school system can do all of it, they should do all of it. And they should do it all as quickly as possible. And they should adhere to it all as stringently as possible. So it's both vaccinations, it's masking, universal masking, it's um, having a really low density classrooms, folks stay, staying six feet apart, um, eliminating uh, the kinds of scenarios that we've seen for schools that have seen uh, transmission. For instance, in the teacher's lounge, teachers will take their masks off and, and eat at the same table and transmit the mm -hmm. virus to each other. Um, th those are all things that, that really, you know, those practices should be eliminated. Um, the evidence that I've seen says that there, uh, especially in schools that do adhere to all of these public health protocols, there's very low rates of transmission. Uh, some schools that are particularly adherent and stringent see no transmission um, in the school. Uh, and and uh, for the, the schools that are still a little lax, the transmission is adult to adult, not necessarily child to child or child to, um, to adult within the school system. So that's, I mean, really it's, there's, there's a way to do this safely and it's let's just throw it all together. It's have vaccination with all of those other kinds of measures together. Really great information. Uh, Sue Ann, do we have one more or should we move yes, on? Yes, I have another question uh, from Sophie on Kingsbury Lee. What could high school students do to spread accurate information about the vaccine as a resource for both other students as well as for their community? I, I think Karen, it's- Karen, do you wanna jump in here? Oh, I'm sorry, Chini, go ahead. Oh no, go ahead, uh, go ahead, Karen. Thank you. Um, so it's curating again your um, resources such as um, CDC, for example, or your local Department of Health as to um, what is the case rate and how are um, the services being um, delivered. Um, and then with those, those identified sources, um, you can also um, ensure that um, 
with um, DC, for example, uh, we actually have a cadre of medical um, professionals who signed up specifically to be speakers. And so um, if you happen to be in DC, um, then you can tap into that resource to come and speak to your community so that the students are empowered to feel that they are engaged in the prevention process and working together with their community leaders. Thank you. Oh, good. Oh, good. And Jenny, did you have something to add? I was just going to say that, you know, that teenagers particularly thrive on social networks. And um, it's really, really important that on social networks that they make an effort to not just propagate accurate information from accurate resources such as the CDC, um, but also to dispel false information and, and, and false um, notions of, of things as they see them. So I think, you know, that's a very important role that they can play with their peers. Yeah, for sure. And they are social, I think. But let's move over to policy. <laughs> um, you know, what, what policies are in place or being put in place to expedite the um, vaccine approvals and vaccine distribution process? And might you know something about this? I, 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 yes, I've heard of a couple of things. So actually one of the, the policies that was um, put into place early on, um, you know, I, I, I mentioned early on that the science is, is one of the bright spots. Um, and it, you know, it's not just the ingenuity, it's also a policy that, that went along with um, saying, we've got great candidates. How do we uh, ensure that we can get uh, the studies that need to be done, the safety studies, the FAQ studies done as, as quickly as possible, not by cutting corners, but actually there was a policy put in place to say, we have these different trial networks that um, are supported by um, you know, a grant for an HIV trial here or a cancer trial there or mm -hmm. an influenza vaccine trial there. The policy was put in place, let's put them all together. Let's put all of these different trials that are um, uh, located in different parts of the country. Let's, let's have them all talk to each other. Let's have them all work, to, to work together. And that did a couple of things. One, it allowed for a lot of um, wonderful data sharing. It also allowed for uh, a faster recruitment of participants and faster recruitment of participants that have historically been difficult to recruit, such as minorities and, um, and, and, and undocumented uh, populations and, and just populations that wouldn't normally be participating at as high a rate as quickly as possible. That challenge was overcome early through a policy that said, let's all start collaborating from our different pockets, even though we were set up to run an HIV trial or a cancer trial, we're all now going to pivot and work together for this uh, COVID trial. Boy, that's so important. Rita, I believe you have an AARP perspective on this as well. Uh, well, really, again, my focus is uh, predominantly on caregiving. Um, and so when we look, again, at policies uh, in this space, it really is um, trying to work more, as Ian said, around how to ensure the equitable distribution um, of the vaccines um, and to also ensure from perspectives of those in nursing homes um, and other spaces that caregivers and the older adults that they support um, are, are cared for um, in this time. Yeah, we can't, we got to remember the caregivers are so important. Um, and yet, each state is doing something differently when it comes to you know, distribution. Every state is, has their own course um, of, of action. And what we're learning, um, what are we learning based on the rollout of the vaccines and how are we incorporating best practices in each of those states? Uh, Chinny, can you tell us what Walmart is doing? Yeah, so, um, you know, we, have now rolled out to over 40 states. And, and we started out with particularly our state-based um, vaccine allocation. And you know, we follow the state guidelines on, on sort of tiering where what high-risk population groups can um, can get the vaccine and, and design our programs around that. And then um, in February we got a, a approval for a federal allocation 
which has really advanced our efforts to be able to give vaccine to particularly, you know, healthcare deserts and, and needs. So we've been, um, we've been working with both. And, and, and I think it's, it's been a really good partnership on both sides. We've had to adapt to every state and some of the sort of, uh, you know, regulations that the state put in around vaccine delivery. Um, and, and so, but our pharmacists have been able to adapt and, and do what's needed in that way. And we've been able to adapt our scheduling platform as well. Good, good to hear. Rita, I, I know you're on the caregiving side, but I'm sure you've heard, you know, what, what's working for, um, what are some of the challenges, for instance, in some of the solutions that AARP is seeing? Yes, again, I think it's it's access. So um, what are ways, creative ways that um, we can get the vaccines to individuals? Um, I think, you know, if you're looking through at, at media, et cetera, you see, again, long lines or you see people going to vaccination sites. But one example, um, or what about those that are homebound and that still need these vaccines um, but can't get to them? So we have seen across the country um, different models that are allowing those that are homebound um, to receive them. And sometimes the caregiver in the home is able to receive them at the same time um, and sometimes not. Um, I think that it's also important, again, on the education front, um, to ensure that um, uh, states are working with community leaders. And so if we're looking um, in communities of color, uh, one such place is working with faith-based leaders. So how are we working to ensure that there are vaccination sites available there or that uh, the faith-based leaders um, are educated on what to say to congregations and where to steer congregations. So those are kind of the two areas that, that I would talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and that totally makes sense as far as an approach. Karen, um, from a best practice perspective, what are you seeing as the best way to support these communities of color? So in my commissioner uh, role, um, definitely again, boots on the ground, but in a different realm of policy. And with the town halls that the DC mayor has been having, um, I've seen uh, personally um, a success where, for example, earlier on in the pandemic, when there was the indiscriminate um, prescribing a Plaquenil, I brought up the concern regarding um, what about those patients who actually need it for indicated purposes. And there was a moratorium memo issued the very next day. I love that. Um, and then to um, read his point, um, having the community leaders raising voice collectively there at the town hall, where we were talking about vaccine access, particularly geared towards um, the communities wards five, seven, and eight, in which they were impacted, not just by um, case, case numbers, but by mortality. And so that ongoing input from the community is needed so that we can have targeted efforts through that health equity lens. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much for that, that insight right there. That's really important. So Ann, do we have a, uh, another question? Yes, uh, I hear that if our elderly and the caregivers are successfully vaccinated, might there be a possibility the interaction could be more favorable? So hand-holding, hugging would be okay, but do they need to still wear facial masks? So this is like that misinformation or accurate information. Yeah, and I think um, Ian touched on that uh, a little bit ago, right? Um, any, Rita, Karen, Chini, do you wanna take that on? Um, Ian, you can take that on too. <laughs> I'll let someone else go first. Okay. Um, I, I would say that, um, you know, I, I know we all want to get back to life as normal. And I know that um, with all of us being vaccinated and, and particular elderly who are high risk being vaccinated, it lends itself to more safety. But until we have conclusive data on whether the vaccine decreases transmittability, which we're starting to see some positive things coming out of some of the studies in Israel, I would, um, you know, I think we still need to socially distance and, and, and make sure we follow the guidelines to protect our elderly at this point. 
Yeah, absolutely. Agreed. And in addition to that universal uh, masking and social distancing, it's because even after you've been vaccinated, the effectiveness rate is not at 100%. So um, for that even small percentage of 5%, um, you want to stay protected as well as for your family members. Rita, do you have anything you'd like to add? I was going to say, I totally agree. And I, I actually think that that messaging is really, really key to get out to individuals that even with, um, you know, nursing homes opening up, there are strict guidelines around, you know, what you can do, the space that you're able to be in. You know, fortunately, it's getting warmer in many parts of the country. So you're able to be outside. Um, but again, I one of the things I would say is that as, uh, the messaging continues to evolve. And this messaging needs to happen in all languages. Um, that um, it is really important that people understand that there still is some risk associated, but not just identifying the risk, coming, helping individuals, families that haven't been with loved ones in, in, in many, many months, helping them find creative ways um, uh, to still be able to engage with their family members, um, but be protected. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, Ian, um, you want to chime in here? Sure, yeah. Um, so I, I think this, this maybe lends itself to something a little bit that we, we have, not, have not quite touched on, which is um, the, the level of protection for uh, all three vaccines. And mm -hmm. the, right now with the media, there's, a, a, there's a, an urge to want to compare them side by side. Um, and say one is better than the other, but, but uh, the honest truth is that they were not developed in, side by side. They were not developed the same way. The first two vaccines, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine were, were developed and the clinical studies were conducted and the efficacy data was collected early on in, in the pandemic when uh, there was, you know, for lack of a better word, the original variant um, circulating. And so these first two vaccines were really great and really effective fighting the first variant. Um, uh, as the year went on and as we had uh, more transmission, more spread, variants started popping up all over the globe. And we've seen that, for instance, the variant first identified in South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, if, if patients uh, 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 or patient samples that are exposed to that South African variant, those patient samples um, are not as good at uh, detecting and clearing the virus um, as as uh, as they they would be against the original variant. So so what does that mean? So it means that today we're living in a slightly different COVID world with more variants circulating, and we don't know exactly how effective the first two vaccines will be against the South African variant, a UK variant, or a variant that will pop up in. San Francisco or New York or Chicago in a month or in two months. So we may not have, um, uh, we may not be out of the woods, right? We, we might still see uh, folks who are vaccinated against the original strain uh, become moderately, mild to moderately sick against a new strain that is just emerging now that, that we have yet to identify. So again, keeping those um, social distancing, masking and public health measures in place is, uh, is the, that second layer, that additional layer that we really need to protect ourselves and make sure that virus transmission um, is eliminated as best as possible. Yeah, great, great insights, we appreciate that. Um, I believe we have one more question. Yes, uh, this is around mental health. And so we're hearing from some, our teens are not coping mentally well with COVID-19, such as some are taking their lives. And does this mental anguish, how does that impact adults across the country and the different ethnic groups? And is there any data around that? Mm. Ian or, or Rita, Karen, do you have anything on that? Or Chinny, have you heard? <laughs> So first, um, for my patients, not um, necessarily quantitatively, do I have things um, right at the top of my head, but um, qualitatively for um, my patients, they definitely have been mentioning to me how different their school experiences. I work at a, a student health center and how their um, 
perception of, of engagement, of de-stressing is totally recalibrated. Um, and we've definitely had heard about um, just the each developmental stage, all of the different unique life experiences along the way, like having prom, having the dorm experience, um, being able to see um, a wedding with all your family members. Um, it's so different. Um, and so I find myself um, often um, sitting um, with the patients who actually come in or just having a moment when we're doing a telehealth appointment to um, discuss that and to give that space, um, particularly given my patient population is African-American, there have been trauma upon trauma upon trauma that I can't capture um, that others here might be able to say better or those in the audience. And um, this has been like a awful uh, protracted time and being able to offer uh, mental health services is really important. So looping my patients in with the counseling services on campus, but um, as I was saying in my commissioner role, we have done several um, town halls in which we focused on multicultural healing together. And that was um, really powerful. I have resources um, that I can share with um, Suan and Kim afterwards if the rest of the group would like to um, um, know about them, including the audience members. And then lastly, um, in different ways, each of us as, as Rita is a representative of um, caregivers, we also need our own healing. And so I actually have a resource specifically for healers in their being able to be healed themselves. So happy to share those resources. That's great, thank you. Well, um, we only have a couple more questions left. So, um, you know, we talked a little bit about resources. What are the resources that are available to keep, um, for us to keep informed? And what can we do to help ourselves during this time? Uh, Rita, you want to go first? Sure. At AARP, uh, we've put together a number of resources, um, both in dealing with COVID-19, uh, prevention, um, nursing home uh, uh, issues and information, um, as well as around vaccines. And those are available at aarp.com org uh, backslash coronavirus throughout the last year it's hard to believe that it has been a year but throughout the last year we've hosted many teletown halls with experts across the country on a variety of issues um, we've spoken with leaders from communities of color and those are all found on that um, website as well um, we also know that around family caregiving um, they are, caregivers have always done complex care. They've always done wound care and other complex things that they really need support on. Unfortunately, through COVID-19, um, that urgency for support has become even greater because so many people are fearful of mm -hmm. leaving their home or asking their um, clinicians uh, for help. So we have another uh, website, ARP.org, backslash caregiving and aarp.org backslash no longer alone that lead to many different resources for family caregivers. Um, this has been just a tragic time where more family caregivers find themselves having to do advanced care planning, end of life conversations, um, things that they really didn't think that they needed to do. Um, and as I think everyone on this panel has talked about the, the dire isolation, whether you are a mother uh, that is trying to work and care for young children at home, um, whether you are a mother that might have had to step out of the workforce to do that care or care for someone, uh, uh, provide elder care, it's this, this sense of, of isolation. And so there are resources um, on that page as well. And then I think just in closing on this, I think, um, creating a safe space for people to just throw in that white towel and say, it really is okay to say, I cannot do this anymore by myself. I need help. Um, and, and whatever that question or vein um, is, that individuals should not feel ashamed um, to ask for help because they truly are not in this alone. Perhaps someone, um, I think Daphne Kwok was on, is in the audience. Um, perhaps one of your colleagues can put, um, 
those uh, links into the chat box. That would be awesome. Chinny, do you have, um, I wanna talk a, a moment about some resources that um, Walmart may have as well. Yeah, so Walmart has um, leveraged community resources as well as faith-based organizations and other resources for support um, and, and that are available on our website when you, when you go in to schedule. Um, as far as resources to educate on the vaccine, um, our, we, we have resources online, but also, you know, talking to our pharmacist would be a great resource to, to get the facts and, and understand um, what, you know, what is out there and, and what they can expect. So we, we have provided that on, um, on, on our website and our community pages. Perfect. Great. If you if you wouldn't mind doing what Rita just did, she just typed it in on, on the chat box. That would be awesome. I think it's walmart.com forward slash COVID vaccine or something yeah. like that. So, um, so I'd like to ask you all, our panelists, to share one final thought. Um, Rita, because you're in my top left box, so I'm going to start with you. <laughs> I think I almost said it in the last piece. I think that uh, we have found um, over the last year um, just the importance on coming together to really recognize, um, particularly for this audience, for women, for uh, uh, multicultural communities, the effect that this virus has had. Um, and as Karen spoke about earlier, for many of the communities, particularly the Black community, that it's the virus, but then it's lay layered with other social injustices and other realities that have really come to surface. It's like COVID-19 ripped off this really big Band-Aid that just laid to bare ugliness. And so I'd like to say that this is an unfortunate opportunity for us as organizations across the country that have deep roots in communities to be a part of the healing, to be a part of the solutions, and to encourage and develop uh, these spaces so that this doesn't continue to happen and that we learn and that systems are changed, cultures are changed, um, and that we do better. We know better and we do better. I like that that bit of hope there. Thank you for for putting that in there, Ian. Let's. How about you? Well, I, I love that that last sentiment. Uh, when we know better, let's do better. Um, you know, and it, it makes me think of a an ever evolving uh, you know suite of scientific information and what do we what do we do? How do we uh, deal with you know things that seem to be constantly changing, but they're constantly changing because we're we're knowing more and uh, or following the science and doing the best we can with the best information we have at the time. And I think uh, if, if anything else, I think it's, it's uh, everyone seeing the value of, uh, of, of, of keeping that um, at the forefront of making the best decisions with the best information and having the grace to say, you know, we don't know it all or, or we don't know absolutely, but this is the this is the best that we that we know of. Uh, you know, we know these vaccines worked uh, six months ago, and the best information is they'll work in the future. But if we find out they don't, uh, we'll make better decisions with better information in the future. And and ho and holding that um, uh, holding that principle to be true, I think will will also carry us a long way. Yeah, Jenny, final thoughts. You know, I, I, I think that there's a lot we're going to be dealing with for years to come. The mental health crisis that's going to come from this, the healthcare disparities that have come out of us realizing and, and what an underprepared public health infrastructure can, can do if, if, you know, when hit. So there's a lot of lessons here. Um, but I, I think also we've learned a lot of good things, right? We've learned um, that we need to invest in science and what science can do you know, from in one year, fastest developed vaccine ever. Um, we've also learned what a public and private partnership looks like when private industry backs public health, what that can do to move things for this country. And I think we need to use that now to, uh, to help solve the problems of healthcare disparities and, and to help solve some of the problems we have. 
you know, that we, we've learned a lot of valuable lessons also during this, that we can deliver medicine through telehealth. You know, we can, there's a lot we can do when we need to do it and we can do it. Great points. And, and Karen, how about you? Um, and to um, Dr. Peluru's point about um, shaking it up, challenging the status quo, that um, in this um, opportunity that we can hold our, our government um, accountable by um, working together with local officials in town halls, driving um, that policy into action, raising up our voices for multicultural women and men um, here in this space um, collectively. And so I really appreciate this opportunity to speak together and learning from the insights of everyone here. Oh, goodness. Well, thanks to all of you, to all of our panelists for sharing your wisdom and your insights. And my goodness, you all are wise. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for what you're doing to help in our communities and our families and our country. Um, we applaud you. So at this point, I am going to kick it over to Sue Ann. Thank you, Joanne. What an incredible conversation and so much knowledge in this panel. So we appreciate it. And hopefully we can actually take action uh, moving forward to help ourselves and help others. So with that, um, thank you to our sponsors, AARP, ADP, Walmart, and UPS. Please take a moment to take the survey that was put in the chat box. And now the next session, you will have a choice between two sessions. One is step into the fire with confidence, recognizing bullying and harassment, sexual harassment at work. And second is listen to your inner voice, build your self-confidence and trust your instincts. So incredible, a lineup of additional, more great speakers, just like our panel here. And I hope to see you at the next session. So thank you everyone. And we'll see you soon. <laughs>